The International Criminal Court, commonly referred to as ICC or ICT, is a permanent tribunal to prosecute individuals for genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes, and the crime of aggression, although jurisdiction for the crime of aggression will not be awakened until 2017, at the earliest. The ICC was created by the Rome Statute which came into force on 1 July 2002. The court has established itself in The Hague, Netherlands, but its proceedings may take place anywhere. It is intended to complement existing national judicial systems and may only exercise its jurisdiction when national courts are unwilling or unable to investigate or prosecute such crimes. Currently, 122 states are states' parties to the statute of the court, including all of South America, nearly all of Europe most of Oceania, and roughly half the countries in Africa. A further 31 countries, including Russia, have signed but not ratified the Rome Statute. The law of treaties obliges these states to refrain from acts which would defeat the object and purpose of the treaty until they declare they do not intend to become a party to the treaty. Three of these states Israel, Sudan, and the United States have informed the Secretary General that they no longer intend to become states' parties, and, as such, have no legal obligations arising from their former representative signature of the statute. Forty-one United Nations member states have neither signed nor ratified or acceded to the Rome Statute. Some of them, including China and India, are critical of the court. On 21 January 2009, the Palestinian National Authority formally accepted the jurisdiction of the court. On 3 April 2012, ICC prosecutor declared himself unable to determine that Palestine is a state for the purposes of the Rome Statute and referred such decision to the United Nations. On 29 November 2012, the United Nations General Assembly voted in favor of recognizing Palestine as a non-member observer state. The ICC has been accused by many, including the African Union, for primarily targeting people from Africa. To date, all the ICC's cases have been from African countries. Four out of eight current investigations originate, however, from the referrals of the situations to the court by the concerned states' parties themselves. Trial History to Date the ICC issued an arrest warrant for Omar al-Bashir of Sudan over alleged war crimes in Darfur. To date, the prosecutor has opened investigations into eight situations in Africa, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Uganda, the Central African Republic, Darfur, Sudan, the Republic of Kenya, the Libyan Arab Jamahi Riya, the Republic of Cote d'Ivoire and Mali. Of these eight, four were referred to the court by the concerned states' parties themselves, Uganda, Democratic Republic of the Congo, Central African Republic and Mali, two were referred by the United Nations Security Council, Darfur, and Libya, and two were begun proprio motu, by the prosecutor, Kenya, and Cote d'Ivoire. Additionally, by power of attorney from the Union of the Comoros, a law firm referred the situation on the Comorian flagged MV Mavi Marmara vessel to the court prompting the prosecutor to initiate a preliminary examination. The court's pre-trial chambers have publicly indicted 32 people. The ICC has issued arrest warrants for 23 individuals and summonses to nine others. Five persons are in detention. Proceedings against 24 are ongoing, 10 are at large as fugitives, 4 have been arrested but are not in the court's custody, including 1 who is appealing an order referring the case against him to national authorities, 4 are in the pre-trial phase, another 4 are at trial, 1 is appealing his sentence and 1 individual's acquittal is being appealed by the prosecution. Proceedings against state have been completed, four have had the charges against them dismissed, one has had the charges against him withdraw, and three have died before trial. As of October 2013, the court's first trial, the Labanga trial, in the situation of the Dr. Congo, is in the appeals phase after the accused was found guilty and sentenced to 14 years in prison, and a reparations regime was established. The Katanga Chui trial regarding the Dr. Congo was concluded in May 2012. Mr. Najolo Chui was acquitted and released. 
the prosecutor has appealed the acquittal. The decision regarding Mr. Katanga is pending. The Bemba trial regarding the Central African Republic is ongoing with the defense presenting its evidence. A fourth trial, in the case Ruto Sang regarding the situation in Kenya, began on 10 September 2013. There is another trial in the Kenya situation which is scheduled to begin in November 2013, namely the Kenyatta trial. Another trial chamber for the Banda trial in the situation of Darfur, Sudan, has been established with the trial scheduled to begin in May 2014. The decision on the confirmation of charges in the Laurent Bogbo case in the Cote d'Ivoire situation is pending after hearings took place in February 2013 and after the decision was adjourned to give the prosecutor more time to present compelling evidence. The confirmation of charges hearing in the Ndaganda case in the Dr. Congo situation is scheduled to begin in September 2013. History of ICC The establishment of an international tribunal to judge political leaders accused of war crimes was first made during the Paris Peace Conference in 1919 by the Commission of Responsibilities. The issue was addressed again at a conference held in Geneva under the auspices of the League of Nations on 1 the 16th of November 1937 which resulted in the conclusion of the first convention stipulating the establishment of a permanent international court to try acts of international terrorism. The convention was signed by 13 governments but was never ratified and the convention never entered into effect. The United Nations stated that the General Assembly first recognized the need for a permanent international court to deal with atrocities of the kind committed during World War II in 1948, following the Nuremberg and Tokyo Tribunals. At the request of the General Assembly, the International Law Commission drafted two statutes by the early 1950s, but these were shelved as the Cold War made the establishment of an international criminal court politically unrealistic. Benjamin B. Ference, an investigator of Nazi war crimes after World War II, and the chief prosecutor for the United States Army at the Einsatzgruppen trial, one of the 12 military trials held by the U.S. authorities at Nuremberg, later became a vocal advocate of the establishment of an international rule of law and of an international criminal court. In his first book published in 1975, entitled Defining International Aggression The Search for World Peace, he argued for the establishment of such an international court. The idea was revived in 1989 when A.N.R. Robinson, then Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago, proposed the creation of a permanent international court to deal with the illegal drug trade. While work began on a draft statute, the international community established ad hoc tribunals to try war crimes in the former Yugoslavia and Rwanda, established in 1994, for their highlighting the need for a permanent international criminal court. In June 1989, motivated in part by an effort to combat drug trafficking, Trinidad, and Tobago resurrected a pre-existing proposal for the establishment of an ICC, and the NGA asked that the ILC resume its work on drafting a statute. The conflicts in Bosnia-Herzegovina and Croatia as well, as in Rwanda, in the early 1990s, and the Mass Commission of Crimes Against Humanity, War Crimes, and Genocide led the Insecurity Council to establish two separate temporary ad hoc tribunals to hold individuals accountable for these atrocities, for their highlighting the need for a permanent international criminal court. In 1994, YLC presented its final draft statute for an ICC to the NGA and recommended that a conference of plenipotentiaries be convened to negotiate a treaty and enact the statute. To consider major substantive issues in the draft statute, the General Assembly established the Ad Hoc Committee on the Establishment of an International Criminal Court, which met twice in 1995. After considering the committee's report, the NGA created the Preparatory Committee on the Establishment of ICC to prepare a consolidated draft text.
from 1996 to 1998. Six sessions of the Impreparatory Committee were held at the United Nations headquarters in New York, in which NOS provided input into the discussions and attended meetings under the umbrella of the No Coalition for an ICC, CICC. In January 1998, the Bureau and coordinators of the Preparatory Committee convened for an intersessional meeting in Zutphen, the Netherlands, to technically consolidate and restructure the draft articles into a draft. The United States and Israel refused to ratify, acknowledge, or adhere to ICC. Following years of negotiations, the General Assembly convened a conference in Rome in June 1998 with the aim of finalizing a treaty. On 17 July 1998, the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court was adopted by a vote of 120 to 7, with 21 countries abstaining. The seven countries that voted against the treaty were China, Iraq, Israel, Libya, Qatar, United States, and Yemen. The Rome Statute became a binding treaty on the 11th of April, 2002, when the number of countries that had ratified it reached 60. The statute legally came into force on the 1st of July, 2002, and the ICC can only prosecute crimes committed after that date. The first bench of 18 judges was elected by an assembly of states parties in February 2003. They were sworn in at the inaugural session of the court on the 11th of March, 2003. The court issued its first arrest warrants on the 8th of July, 2005, and the first pre-trial hearings were held in 2006. During a review conference of the International Criminal Court Statute in Kampala, Uganda, two amendments to the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court were adopted on 10 and the 11th of June, 2010. The Second Amendment concerns the definition of the crime of aggression. Jurisdiction The court has four mechanisms which grant it jurisdiction. First, if the accused is a national of a state party to the Rome Statute. Second, if the alleged crime took place on the territory of a state party. Third, if a situation is referred to the court by the United Nations Security Council. Fourth, if a state not party to the statute accepts the court's jurisdiction. The ICC is intended to complement existing national judicial systems and may only exercise its jurisdiction when national courts are unwilling or unable to investigate or prosecute such crimes. The current ICC president, Sang Hai Un Song, has described the court as a fail-safe justice mechanism which holds that states have the primary responsibility to investigate and prosecute Rome statute crimes occurring within their jurisdiction. Crimes within the jurisdiction of the court. Part 2. Article 5 of the Rome Statute grants the court jurisdiction over four groups of crimes which it refers to as the most serious crimes of concern to the international community as a whole the crime of genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes, and the crime of aggression. The statute defines each of these crimes except for aggression. The crime of genocide is unique because the crime must be committed with intent to destroy. Crimes against humanity are specifically listed prohibited acts when committed as part of a widespread or systematic attack directed against any civilian population. The statute provides that the court will not exercise its jurisdiction over the crime of aggression until such time as the state's parties agree on a definition of the crime and set out the conditions under which it may be prosecuted. In June 2010, the ICC's first review conference in Kampala, Uganda adopted amendments defining crimes of aggression and expanding the ICC's jurisdiction over them. The ICC will not be allowed to prosecute for this crime until at least 2017. Furthermore, it expanded the term of war crimes for the use of certain weapons in an armed conflict not of an international character. Many states wanted to add terrorism and drug trafficking to the list of crimes covered by the Rome Statute, however, the states were unable to agree on a definition for terrorism, and it was decided not to include drug trafficking, as this might overwhelm the court's limited resources. 
India lobbied to have the use of nuclear weapons and other weapons of mass destruction included as war crimes, but this move was also defeated. India has expressed concern that the statute of the ICC lays down, by clear implication, that the use of weapons of mass destruction is not a war crime. This is an extraordinary message to send to the international community. Some commentators have argued that the Rome Statute defines crimes too broadly or too vaguely. For example, China has argued that the definition of war crimes goes beyond that accepted under customary international law. Territorial Jurisdiction During the negotiations that led to the Rome Statute, a large number of states argued that the court should be allowed to exercise universal jurisdiction. However, this proposal was defeated due in large part to opposition from the United States. A compromise was reached, allowing the court to exercise jurisdiction only under the following limited circumstances. Where the person accused of committing a crime is a national of a state party, or where the person's state has accepted the jurisdiction of the court. Where the alleged crime was committed on the territory of a state party, or where the state on whose territory the crime was committed has accepted the jurisdiction of the court, or where a situation is referred to the court by the Insecurity Council. Temporal Jurisdiction The court's jurisdiction does not apply retroactively, it can only prosecute crimes committed on or after the 1st of July, 2002 the date on which the Rome Statute entered into force. Where a state becomes party to the Rome Statute, after that date, the court can exercise jurisdiction automatically with respect to crimes committed after the statute enters into force for that state. Complementarity The ICC is intended as a court of last resort, investigating and prosecuting only where national courts have failed. Article 17 of the statute provides that a case is inadmissible if a. The case is being investigated or prosecuted by a state which has jurisdiction over it, unless the state is unwilling or unable genuinely to carry out the investigation or prosecution. b. The case has been investigated by a state which has jurisdiction over it and the state has decided not to prosecute the person concerned, unless the decision resulted from the unwillingness or inability of the state genuinely to prosecute. c. The person concerned has already been tried for conduct which is the subject of the complaint, and a trial by the court is not permitted under Article 20, Paragraph 3. d. The case is not of sufficient gravity to justify further action by the court. Article 20, Paragraph 3, specifies that, if a person has already been tried by another court, the ICC cannot try them again for the same conduct, unless the proceedings in the other court a. were for the purpose of shielding the person concerned from criminal responsibility for crimes within the jurisdiction of the court, or b. Otherwise were not conducted independently or impartially in accordance with the norms of due process recognized by international law, and were conducted in a manner which, in the circumstances, was inconsistent with an intent to bring the person concerned to justice. Structure In June 2010, two amendments to the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court were adopted by the Review Conference in Kampala, Uganda. The First Amendment criminalizes the use of certain kinds of weapons in non-international conflicts, whose use was already forbidden in international conflicts. It has been ratified by 14 states' parties and is in force in three of them. The Second Amendment specifies the crime of aggression. It has been ratified by 11 states' parties and is in force in two of them. However, per the language of the amendment, the court will only have jurisdiction over the crime of aggression after two additional conditions are met. 1. The amendment has entered into force for 30 states' parties, and 2. On a date after 1 January 2017, the Assembly of States' Parties has voted in favor of allowing the court to exercise jurisdiction. The ICC is governed by an Assembly of States' Parties. The court consists of four main organs, the presidency, the judicial divisions, the office of the prosecutor, and the registry. State parties. 
As of May 2013, 122 states are states parties to the statute of the court, including all of South America, nearly all of Europe, most of Oceania, and roughly half the countries in Africa. A further 31 countries, including Russia, have signed but not ratified the Rome Statute. The law of treaties obliges these states to refrain from acts which would defeat the object and purpose of the treaty until they declare they do not intend to become a party to the treaty. Three of these states Israel, Sudan, and the United States have informed the Secretary General that they no longer intend to become states' parties and, as such, have no legal obligations arising from their former representative signature of the statute. Forty-one United Nations member states have neither signed nor ratified or acceded to the Rome Statute. Some of them, including China and India, are critical of the court. On the 21st of January, 2009, the Palestinian National Authority formally accepted the jurisdiction of the court. On the 3rd of April, 2012, the ICC prosecutor declared himself unable to determine that Palestine is a state for the purposes of the Rome Statute and referred such decision to the United Nations. On the 29th of November, 2012, the United Nations General Assembly voted in favor of recognizing Palestine as a non-member observer state. Assembly of States Parties The Court's Management Oversight and legislative body, the Assembly of States Parties, consists of one representative from each state party. Each state party has one vote and every effort has to be made to reach decisions by consensus. If consensus cannot be reached, decisions are made by vote. The Assembly is presided over by a president and two vice presidents, who are elected by the members to three-year terms. The Assembly meets in full session, once a year in New York or The Hague, and may also hold special sessions where circumstances require. Sessions are open to observer states and non-governmental organizations. The Assembly elects the judges and prosecutors, decides the court's budget, adopts important texts, such as the rules of procedure and evidence, and provides management oversight to the other organs of the court. Article 46 of the Rome Statute allows the Assembly to remove from office a judge or prosecutor who is found to have committed serious misconduct or a serious breach of his or her duties or is unable to exercise the functions required by the statute. The state's parties cannot interfere with the judicial functions of the court. Disputes concerning individual cases are settled by the judicial divisions. In 2010, Kampala, Uganda hosted the Assembly's Rome Statute Review Conference. In 2011, New York hosted the Assembly's Rome Statute Review Conference. Presidency Presidency of the International Criminal Court Philip Kirsch, President of the Court, from 2003 to 2009 the Presidency is responsible for the proper administration of the Court, apart from the Office of the Prosecutor. It comprises the President and the First and Second Vice Presidents three judges of the Court, who are elected to the Presidency by their fellow judges for a maximum of two three-year terms. The current President is Sanghai Eun Song, who was elected on the 11th of March, 2009. Judicial Divisions the judicial divisions consist of the 18 judges of the court, organized into three chambers the pre-trial chamber, trial chamber, and appeals chamber which carry out the judicial functions of the court. Judges are elected to the court by the Assembly of States Parties. They serve nine-year terms and are not generally eligible for re-election. All judges must be nationals of states' parties to the Rome Statute, and no two judges may be nationals of the same state. They must be persons of high moral character, impartiality, and integrity, who possess the qualifications required in their respective states for appointment to the highest judicial offices. The prosecutor or any person being investigated or prosecuted may request the disqualification of a judge from any case in which his or her impartiality might reasonably be doubted on any ground. Any request for the disqualification of a judge from a particular case is decided by an absolute majority of the other judges.
a judge may be removed from office if he or she is found to have committed serious misconduct or a serious breach of his or her duties or is unable to exercise his or her functions. The removal of a judge requires both a two-thirds majority of the other judges and a two-thirds majority of the state's parties. Office of the Prosecutor Prosecutor of the International Criminal Court The Office of the Prosecutor is responsible for conducting investigations and prosecutions. It is headed by the Chief Prosecutor, who is assisted by one or more Deputy Prosecutors. The Rome Statute provides that the Office of the Prosecutor shall act independently, as such, no member of the Office may seek or act on instructions from any external source such as states, international organizations, non-governmental organizations or individuals. The Prosecutor may open an investigation under three circumstances. When a situation is referred to him or her by a state party. When a situation is referred to him or her by the United Nations Security Council, acting to address a threat to international peace and security, or when the pretrial chamber authorizes him or her to open an investigation on the basis of information received from other sources, such as individuals or non governmental organizations. Any person being investigated or prosecuted may request the disqualification of a prosecutor from any case in which their impartiality might reasonably be doubted on any ground. Requests for the disqualification of prosecutors are decided by the appeals chamber. A prosecutor may be removed from office by an absolute majority of the state's parties if he or she is found to have committed serious misconduct or a serious breach of his or her duties, or is unable to exercise his or her functions. However, critics of the court argue that there are insufficient checks and balances on the authority of the ICC prosecutor and judges, and insufficient protection against politicized prosecutions or other abuses. Henry Kissinger says the checks and balances are so weak that the prosecutor has virtually unlimited discretion in practice. Some efforts have been made to hold Kissinger himself responsible for perceived injustices of American foreign policy during his tenure in government. As of the 16th of June, 2012, the prosecutor has been Fatou Abensouda of Gambia, who had been elected as the new prosecutor on the 12th of December, 2011. She has been elected for nine years. Her predecessor, Luis Moreno Ocampo of Argentina, had been in office from 2003 to 2012. Registry The registry is responsible for the non-judicial aspects of the administration and servicing of the court. This includes, among other things, the administration of legal aid matters, court management, victims and witnesses matters, defense counsel, detention unit, and the traditional services provided by administrations and international organizations such as finance, translation, building management, procurement, and personnel. The registry is headed by the registrar, who is elected by the judges to a five-year term. The current registrar is Herman von Hebel, who was elected on 8 March 2013. Headquarters, Offices, and Detention Unit International Criminal Court Prosecutors, 2012 The official seat of the court is in The Hague, Netherlands, but its proceedings may take place anywhere. The court is currently housed in interim premises on the eastern edge of The Hague. It intends to construct ICC permanent premises in the Alexander Kazern A to the north of The Hague. The land and financing for the new construction have been provided by the Netherlands, and architects Schmidt Hammerlass and have been retained to design the project. The ICC also maintains a liaison office in New York and field offices in places where it conducts its activities. As of the 18th of October, 2007, the court had field offices in Kampala, Kinshasa, Bunia, Abeka, and Bangui. The ICC's detention center comprises 12 cells on the premises of the Scheveningen branch of the Hague Land and Penal Institution, the Hague. Suspects held by the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia are held in the same prison and share some facilities, like the fitness room, but have no contact with suspects held by the ICC.
The detention unit is close to the ICC's future headquarters in the Alexander Kazerne. As of July 2012, the detention center houses one person convicted by the court, Thomas Labanga, and four suspects. Germain Katanga, Matthew Najolo Chui, Jean Pierre Bemba, and Laurent Bagbo. Additionally, former Liberian President Charles Taylor is held there. Taylor was tried under the mandate and auspices of the Special Court for Sierra Leone, but his trial was held at the ICC's facilities in The Hague because of political and security concerns about holding the trial in Freetown. On 26 April 2012, Taylor was convicted on 11 charges. The ICC does not have its own witness protection program but rather must rely on national programs to keep witness safe. Procedure Trial Trials are conducted under a hybrid common law and civil law judicial system, but it has been argued the procedural orientation and character of the court is still evolving. 87 A majority of the three judges present, as triers of fact, may reach a decision which must include a full and reasoned statement. Trials are supposed to be public, but proceedings are often closed, and such exceptions to a public trial have not been enumerated in detail. In camera proceedings are allowed for protection of witnesses or defendants as well as for confidential or sensitive evidence. Hearsay and other indirect evidence is not generally prohibited, but it has been argued the court is guided by hearsay exceptions which are prominent in common law systems. There is no subpoena or other means to compel witnesses to come before the court, although the court has some power to compel testimony of those who are, such as fines. Rights of the Accused The Rome Statute provides that all persons are presumed innocent until proven guilty beyond reasonable doubt, and establishes certain rights of the accused and persons during investigations. These include the right to be fully informed of the charges against him or her, the right to have a lawyer appointed, free of charge, the right to a speedy trial, and the right to examine the witnesses against him or her. To ensure equality of arms between defense and prosecution teams, the ICC has established an independent Office of Public Counsel for the Defense, OPCD, to provide logistical support, advice, and information to defendants and their counsel. The OPCD also helps to safeguard the rights of the accused during the initial stages of an investigation. However, Thomas Labanga's defense team say they were given a smaller budget than the prosecutor and that evidence and witness statements were slow to arrive. The trial court procedures are similar to the U.S. Guantanamo Military Commission's Victim Participation and Reparations one of the great innovations of the statute of the International Criminal Court and its rules of procedure and evidence is the series of rights granted to victims 101-102 for the first time in the history of international criminal justice. Victims have the possibility, under the statute, to present their views and observations before the court. Participation before the court may occur at various stages of proceedings and may take different forms, although it will be up to the judges to give directions as to the timing and manner of participation. Participation in the court's proceedings will in most cases take place through a legal representative and will be conducted in a manner which is not prejudicial or inconsistent with the rights of the accused and a fair and impartial trial. The victim base provisions within the Rome Statute provide victims with the opportunity to have their voice heard and to obtain, where appropriate, some form of reparation for their suffering. It is this balance between retributive and restorative justice that will enable the ICC not only to bring criminals to justice, but also to help the victims themselves obtain justice. Article 43, 6 establishes a victims and witnesses unit to provide protective measures and security arrangements, counseling, and other appropriate assistance for witnesses, victims who appear before the court, and others who are at risk on account of testimony given by such witnesses. 103 Article 68 sets out procedures for the protection of the victims and witnesses and their participation in the proceedings 104 the court has also established an office of public counsel for victims 
to provide support and assistance to victims and their legal representatives. 105 Article 79 of the Rome Statute establishes a trust fund to make financial reparations to victims and their families. 106. Participation of Victims in Proceedings The section does not cite any references or sources. Please help improve this section by adding citations to reliable sources. Unsourced material may be challenged and removed. June 2011 The Rome Statute contains provisions which enable victims to participate in all stages of the proceedings before the court. Hence victims may file submissions before the pretrial chamber when the prosecutor requests its authorization to investigate. They may also file submissions on all matters relating to the competence of the court or the admissibility of cases. More generally, victims are entitled to file submissions before the court chambers at the pretrial stage, during the proceedings, or at the appeal stage. The rules of procedure and evidence stipulate the time for victim participation in proceedings before the court. They must send a written application to the court registrar, and more precisely to the victim's participation and reparation section, which must submit the application to the competent chamber which decides on the arrangements for the victim's participation in the proceedings. The chamber may reject the application if it considers that the person is not a victim. Individuals who wish to make applications to participate in proceedings before the court must therefore provide evidence proving they are victims of crimes which come under the competence of the court in the proceedings commence before it. The section prepared standard forms and a booklet to make it easier for victims to file their petition to participate in the proceedings. It should be stipulated that a petition may be made by a person acting with the consent of the victim, or in their name, when the victim is a child, or if any disability makes this necessary. Victims are free to choose their legal representative, who must be equally as qualified as the counsel for the defense. This may be a lawyer or a person with experience as a judge or a prosecutor, and be fluent in one of the court's talking languages, English or French. To ensure efficient proceedings, particularly in cases with many victims, the competent chamber may ask victims to choose a shared legal representative. If the victims are unable to appoint one, the chamber may ask the registrar to appoint one or more shared legal representatives. The victim participation and reparation section is responsible for assisting victims with the organization of their legal representation before the court. When a victim or a group of victims does not have the means to pay for a shared legal representative appointed by the court, they may request financial aid from the court to pay counsel. Counsel may participate in the proceedings before the court by filing submissions and attending the hearings. The registry, and within it the victim participation and reparation section, has many obligations with regard to notification of the proceedings to the victims to keep them fully informed of progress. Thus, it is stipulated that the section must notify victims who have communicated with the court, in a given case or situation, of any decisions by the prosecutor not to open an investigation or not to commence a prosecution so that these victims can file submissions before the pretrial chamber responsible for checking the decisions taken by the prosecutor under the conditions laid down in the statute. The same notification is required before the confirmation hearing. In the pretrial chamber, to allow the victims to file all the submissions they require, all decisions taken by the court are then notified to the victims who participated in the proceedings or to their counsel. The victim participation and reparation section has wide discretion to use all possible means to give adequate publicity to the proceedings before the court. Local media requests for cooperation sent to governments, aid requested from those or other means. Reparation for Victims for the first time in the history of humanity, an international court has the power to order an individual to pay reparation to another individual. It is also the first time that an international criminal court has had such power. Pursuant to Article 75, the court may lay down the principles for reparation for victims, which may include restitution, indemnification, and rehabilitation. On this point, 
the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court has benefited from all the work carried out with regard to victims, in particular within the United Nations. The court must also enter an order against a convicted person stating the appropriate reparation for the victims or their beneficiaries. This reparation may also take the form of restitution, indemnification, or rehabilitation. The court may order this reparation to be paid through the Trust Fund for Victims, which was set up by the Assembly of States Parties in September 2002. To be able to apply for reparation, victims have to file a written application with the registry, which must contain the evidence laid down in Rule 94 of the Rules of Procedure and Evidence. The Victim Participation and Reparation section prepared standard forms to make this easier for victims 107. They may also apply for protective measures for the purposes of confiscating property from the persons prosecuted. The Victim Participation and Reparation section is responsible for giving all appropriate publicity to these reparation proceedings to enable victims to make their applications. These proceedings take place after the person prosecuted has been declared guilty of the alleged facts. The court has the option of granting individual or collective reparation concerning a whole group of victims, or a community, or both. If the court decides to order collective reparation, it may order that reparation to be made through the Victims Fund, and the reparation may then also be paid to an intergovernmental, international or national organization. Cooperation by States Not Party to Rome Statute One of the principles of international law is that a treaty does not create either obligations or rights, for third states, pacta tertis any si nascent any si present, without their consent, and this is also enshrined in the 1969 Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties 108. The cooperation of the non-party states with ICC is envisioned by the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court to be a voluntary nature 109. However, even states that have not acceded to the Rome Statute might still be subjects to an obligation to cooperate with ICC in certain cases 110 when the case is referred to the ICC by the Insecurity Council all and member states are obliged to cooperate since its decisions are binding for all of them 111 also there is an obligation to respect and ensure respect for international humanitarian law which stems from the Geneva Conventions and additional protocol I 112 which reflects the absolute nature of IHL 113 although the wording of the conventions might not be precise as to what steps have to be taken, it has been argued that it at least requires non-party states to make an effort not to block actions of ICC in response to serious violations of those conventions 110 in relation to cooperation in investigation and evidence gathering, it is implied from the Rome Statute 114 that the consent of a non-party state is a prerequisite for ICC prosecutor to conduct an investigation within its territory. And it seems that it is even more necessary for him to observe any reasonable conditions raised by that state, since such restrictions exist for states party to the statute 110 taking into account the experience of the ICTY, which worked with the principle of the primacy, instead of complementarity, in relation to cooperation. Some scholars have expressed their pessimism as to the possibility of ICC to obtain cooperation of non-party states 110 as for the actions that ICC can take towards non-party states that do not cooperate. The Rome Statute stipulates that the court may inform the Assembly of States Parties or Security Council when the matter was referred by it. When non-party state refuses to cooperate after it has entered into an ad hoc arrangement or an agreement with the court 115. Amnesties and National Reconciliation Processes It is unclear to what extent ICC is compatible with reconciliation processes that grant amnesty to human rights abusers as part of agreements to end conflict 116 Article 16 of the Rome Statute allows the Security Council to prevent the court from investigating or prosecuting a case. 
117 and Article 53 allows the prosecutor the discretion not to initiate an investigation if he or she believes that an investigation would not serve the interests of justice. 118 Former ICC President Philippe Kirsch has said that some limited amnesties may be compatible with a country's obligations genuinely to investigate or prosecute under the statute. 116. It is sometimes argued that amnesties are necessary to allow the peaceful transfer of power from abusive regimes. By denying states the right to offer amnesty to human rights abusers, the International Criminal Court may make it more difficult to negotiate an end to conflict and a transition to democracy. For example, the outstanding arrest warrants for four leaders of the Lord's Resistance Army are regarded by some as an obstacle to ending the insurgency in Uganda. 119-120 Czech politician Marek Benda argues that the ICC, as a deterrent will in our view only mean the worst dictators will try to retain power at all costs. 121 however. The United Nations 122 and the International Committee of the Red Cross 123 maintain that granting amnesty to those accused of war crimes and other serious crimes is a violation of international law. Criticisms Some in member states, such as China and India, are critical of the court. 124 Clarification needed Checks and balances Critics of the court argue that there are insufficient checks and balances on the authority of ICC prosecutor and judges and insufficient protection against politicized prosecutions or other abuses concerning the Independent Office of Public Counsel for the Defense, OPCD. Thomas Labonga's defense team say they were given a smaller budget than the prosecutor and that evidence and witness statements were slow to arrive. Rights of the Accused an editor has expressed a concern that the section lends undue weight to certain ideas relative to the article as a whole. Please help to discuss and resolve the dispute before removing this message. August 2013 Some argue that the protections offered by the ICC are insufficient. According to the Heritage Foundation Americans who appear before the court would be denied such basic U.S. constitutional rights as trial by a jury of one's peers, protection from double jeopardy, and the right to confront one's accusers 125. Others argue that ICC standards are sufficient. According to the Human Rights Watch, the ICC has one of the most extensive lists of due process guarantees ever written, including presumption of innocence, right to counsel, right to present evidence, and to confront witnesses, right to remain silent, right to be present at trial, right to have charges proved beyond a reasonable doubt, and protection against double jeopardy. 126 According to David Sheffer, who led the U.S. delegation, to the Rome Conference and who voted against adoption of the treaty. When we were negotiating the Rome Treaty, we always kept very close tabs on, does this meet U.S. constitutional tests, the formation of this court, and the due process rights that are accorded defendants. And we were very confident at the end of Rome that those due process rights, in fact, are protected and that this treaty does meet a constitutional test 127. In some common law systems, such as the United States, the right to confront one's accusers is traditionally seen as negatively affected by the lack of an ability to compel witnesses and the admission of hearsay evidence 128-129 which along with other indirect evidence is not generally prohibited. The ICC has been criticized for being contrary to the rights guaranteed by the U.S. Constitution due to the absence of jury trials as well as allegations that retrial is permitted for errors of fact, hearsay is accepted as evidence and that there is no right to a speedy trial and a public trial or reasonable bail. Limitations Limitations exist for the ICC. The Human Rights Watch, HRW, reported that the ICC's prosecutor team takes no account of the roles played by the government in the conflict of Uganda, Rwanda, or Congo. This led to a flawed investigation because the ICC did not reach the conclusion of its verdict after considering the government's position and actions in the conflict. Selective Enforcement Accusations The ICC has been accused of bias 
and as being a tool of Western imperialism, only punishing leaders from small, weak states, while ignoring crimes committed by richer and more powerful states. This sentiment has been expressed particularly by African leaders due to the disproportionate focus of the court on Africa. To date, all eight cases which the ICC has investigated are in African countries. Zimbabwean activist Stan columnist William Muchae noted that the court's overwhelming emphasis on prosecution of Africans, while claiming to have a global mandate, only adds support to claims of being a tool of Western imperialism 130 The prosecution of Kenyan Deputy President William Ruto and President Uhuru Kenyatta, charged before becoming president, led to the Kenyan parliament passing a motion calling for their withdrawing from ICC, and the country has called on the other 34 African states' party to the ICC to withdraw their support. An issue which will be discussed at a planned special African Union summit in October 2013. Though the ICC has denied the charge of disproportionately targeting African leaders and claims to stand up for victims wherever they may be, Kenya was not alone in criticizing the ICC. Sudanese President Omar al-Bashir visited Kenya despite an outstanding ICC warrant for his arrest, but was not arrested. He said that the charges against him are exaggerated and that the ICC was a part of a Western plot against him. Ivory Coast government opted not to transfer former First Lady Simone Gbagbo to the court, but to instead try her at home. Rwanda's ambassador to the African Union, Joseph Nsengimana, argued that it is not only the case of Kenya. We have seen international justice become more and more a political matter. Ugandan President Yoweri Museveni accused ICC of mishandling complex African issues. Ethiopian Prime Minister Hala Mariam Dezalanyo, the O chairman, told the General Assembly at the general debate of the 68th session of the United Nations General Assembly, the manner in which the ICC has been operating has left a very bad impression in Africa. It is totally unacceptable. South African President Jacob Zuma said, the perceptions of the ICC as unreasonable led to the calling of the Special O Summit on the 13th of October. Botswana is a notable supporter of the ICC in Africa 131 at the summit. The O did not endorse the proposal for a mass withdrawal from the ICC due to lack of support for the idea 132. However, the summit did conclude that serving heads of state should not be put on trial and that the Kenyan cases should be deferred. Ethiopian Foreign Minister Tade Rosade Nam said, we have rejected the double standard that the ICC is applying in dispensing international justice 133. Despite these calls, the ICC went ahead with requiring William Ruto to attend his trial 134. Relationships United Nations The Insecurity Council has referred the situation in Darfur to the ICC. Unlike the International Court of Justice, the ICC is legally independent from the United Nations. However, the Rome Statute grants certain powers to the United Nations Security Council. Because the ICC cannot look into anything that happened before its establishment in 2002, it cannot be said that the ICC is functionally independent from the UN. Article 13 allows the Security Council to refer to the court situations that would not otherwise fall under the court's jurisdiction, as it did in relation to the situations in Darfur and Libya, which the court could not otherwise have prosecuted, as neither Sudan nor Libya are state parties. Article 16 allows the Security Council to require the court to defer from investigating a case for a period of 12 months 117 such a deferral may be renewed indefinitely by the Security Council. This sort of an arrangement gives the ICC some of the advantages in hearing in the organs of the United Nations such as using the enforcement powers of the Security Council, but it also creates a risk of being tainted with the political controversies of the Security Council 135. The court cooperates with the UN in many different areas, including the exchange of information and logistical support. 136 The court reports to the UN each year on its activities, 136, 137, and some meetings of the Assembly of States parties are held at UN facilities. The relationship between the court 
and the UN is governed by a relationship agreement between the International Criminal Court and the United Nations 138-139. Non-Governmental Law Organizations During the 1970s and 1980s, international human rights and humanitarian non-governmental law organizations, or NOS, began to proliferate at exponential rates. Concurrently, the quest to find a way to punish international crime shifted from being the exclusive responsibility of legal experts to being shared with international human rights activism. NOS helped birth ICC through advocacy and championing for the prosecution of perpetrators of crimes against humanity. NOS closely monitor the organization's declarations and actions, ensuring that the work that is being executed on behalf of ICC is fulfilling its objectives and responsibilities to civil society 140 according to Benjamin Schiff. From the statute conference onward, the relationship between the ICC and the NOS has probably been closer, more consistent, and more vital to the court than have analogous relations between NOS and any other international organization. There are a number of NOS working on a variety of issues related to the ICC. The NO Coalition for the International Criminal Court has served as a sort of umbrella for NOS to coordinate with each other on similar objectives related to the ICC. The CICC has 2,500 member organizations in 150 different countries 141 The original steering committee included representatives from the World Federalist Movement, the International Commission of Jurists, Amnesty International, the Lawyers Committee for Human Rights, Human Rights Watch, Parliamentarians for Global Action, and No Peace Without Justice 140 Today. Many of the NOS with which the ICC cooperates are members of the CICC. These organizations come from a range of backgrounds, spanning from major international NOS such as Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International, to smaller, more local organizations focused on peace and justice missions 140 Many work closely with states, such as the International Criminal Law Network, founded and predominantly funded by the Hague Municipality and the Dutch Ministries of Defense and Foreign Affairs. The CICC also claims organizations that are themselves federations, such as the International Federation of Human Rights Leagues, FIDH. CICC members ascribe to three principles that permit them to work under the umbrella of the CICC, so long as their objectives match them. Promoting worldwide ratification and implementation of the Rome Statute of the ICC. Maintaining the integrity of the Rome Statute of the ICC, and ensuring the ICC will be as fair, effective, and independent as possible. 141. The NOS that work under the CICC do not normally pursue agendas exclusive to the work of the court, rather, they may work for broader causes, such as general human rights issues, victims' rights, gender rights rule of law, conflict mediation, and peace 140 The CICC coordinates their efforts to improve the efficiency of NOS contributions to the court and to pull their influence on major common issues. From the ICC side, it has been useful to have the CICC channel no contacts with the court so that its officials do not have to interact individually with thousands of separate organizations. NOS have been crucial to the evolution of the ICC, as they assisted in the creation of the normative climate that urged states to seriously consider the court's formation. The legal experts helped shape the statute, while their lobbying efforts built support for it. They advocate statute ratification globally, and work at expert and political levels within member states for passage of necessary domestic legislation. NOS are greatly represented at meetings for the Assembly of States Parties, and they use the ASP meetings to press for decisions promoting their priorities 140 Many of these NOS have reasonable access to important officials at the ICC because of their involvement during the statute process. They are engaged in monitoring, commenting upon, and assisting in the ICC's activities. The ICC many time depends on NOS to interact with local populations. The Registry Public Information Office personnel and victim participation and reparation section officials hold seminars for local leaders, 
professionals, and the media to spread the word about the Court 140. These are the kinds of events that are often hosted or organized by local NOS. Because there can be challenges with determining which of these NOS are legitimate, CICC regional representatives often have the ability to help screen and identify trustworthy organizations. However, NOS are also sources of criticism, exhortation, and pressure. Upon the ICC 140, the ICC heavily depends on NOS for its operations. Although NOS and states cannot directly impact the judicial nucleus of the organization, they can impart information on crimes, can help locate victims and witnesses, and can promote and organize victim participation. NOS outwardly comment on the court's operations, push for expansion of its activities especially in the new justice areas of outreach and conflict areas, in victim participation and reparations, and in upholding due process standards and defense equality of arms. And so implicitly set an agenda for the future evolution of ICC 140. The relatively uninterrupted progression of no involvement with ICC may mean that NOS have become repositories of more institutional historical knowledge about the ICC than have national representatives to it, and have greater expertise than some of the organization's employees themselves. While NOS look to mold the ICC to satisfy the interests and priorities, that they have worked for since the early 1990s, they unavoidably press against the limits imposed upon the ICC by the states that are members of the organization. NOS can pursue their own mandates, irrespective of whether they are compatible with those of other NOS, while the ICC must respond to the complexities of its own mandate as well as those of the states and NOS. Another issue has been that NOS possess exaggerated senses of their ownership over the organization and, having been vital to and successful in promoting the court, were not managing to redefine their roles to permit the court its necessary independence 140 additionally, because there does exist such a gap between the large human rights organizations and the smaller peace-oriented organizations, it is difficult for ICC officials to manage and gratify all of their NOS. ICC officials recognize that the NOS pursue their own agendas and that they will seek to pressure the ICC in the direction of their own priorities rather than necessarily understanding or being fully sympathetic to the myriad constraints and pressures under which the court operates 140 both the ICC and the NO community avoid criticizing each other publicly or vehemently although NOS have released advisory and cautionary messages regarding the ICC they avoid taking stances that could potentially give the court's adversaries, particularly the U.S., more motive to berate the organization. Finance Contributions to the ICC's Budget, 2008 The ICC is financed by contributions from the state's parties. The amount payable by each state party is determined using the same method as the United Nations 142. Each state's contribution is based on the country's capacity to pay, which reflects factors such as a national income and population. The maximum amount a single country can pay in any year is limited to 22% of the court's budget. Japan paid this amount in 2008. The court spent 80.5 million in 2007, 143, and the Assembly of States Parties has approved a budget of 19,382,100 for 2008, 142, and 101,229,900 for 2009 period 144. As of September 2008, the ICC staff consisted of 571 persons from 83 states, 145. Investigations ICC Investigation Screen Official Investigations, Uganda, Democratic Republic of Congo, Central African Republic, Darfur, Sudan, Kenya, Libya, Cote d'Ivoire, and Mali, Lightred, Ongoing Preliminary Examinations, Afghanistan, Colombia, Ethiopia, Georgia, Guinea, Honduras, Nigeria, and South Korea, Darkred, Close Preliminary Examinations, Palestine, Iraq, and Venezuela. 
the court has received complaints about alleged crimes in at least 139 countries, but, currently, the prosecutor of the court has opened investigations into eight situations in Africa, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Uganda, the Central African Republic, Darfur, Sudan, the Republic of Kenya, the Libyan Arab Jamahi Riyadh, the Republic of Cote d'Ivoire and Mali. Of these eight, four were referred to the court by the concerned states parties themselves, Uganda, Democratic Republic of the Congo, Central African Republic and Mali, two were referred by the United Nations Security Council, Darfur, and Libya, and two were begun proprio motu by the prosecutor, Kenya, and Cote d'Ivoire. Additionally, by power of attorney from the Union of the Comoros, a law firm referred the situation on the Comorian flagged MV Mavi Marmara vessel to the court, prompting the prosecutor to initiate a preliminary examination.